Good evening. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Ryan Don Nguyen. I'm a first year studying English and government at the college, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. Now please take your seats and join me in a round of applause for Fred Logoval, the Lawrence D. Belfer Professor of International Affairs at HKS at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Good evening to, to you all. I'm delighted to be uh, with you. My name is Fred Logoval, and I'm on the faculty here at the school, and I'm also in the history department in the college, and so pleased to have an opportunity to introduce uh, tonight's event. Um, part of the IOP John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, obviously, and this is the S.T. Lee Lecture, so I wanna just say a word or two about that before I introduce our speaker. The S.T. Lee Lecture focuses on military history, not exclusively military history, but how uh, political developments, shall we say, and geopolitical developments might shape global approaches to policymaking. The lecture also reflects Lee Seng Ti's dedication to providing a platform for scholars and policymakers to address critical international issues. Li Seng Ti is recognized internationally as a successful business executive, philanthropist, and patron of the arts. So that's the lecture. And our speaker this evening, uh, the presenter of this S.T. Lee lecture is Peter Hessler. Peter Hessler, who hails from Missouri, has been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 2000, so some 22 years. He is or has been until recently the magazine's correspondent in China, a role he also held from 2000 to 2007. So two iterations, and he'll tell us about that this evening. From 2011 to 2016, he was based in Cairo, where he covered the events of the Egyptian Arab Spring. His subjects have included archeology span in both uh, China and Egypt, a factory worker in Shenzhen, a garbage collector in Cairo, a small town druggist in rural Colorado, and Chinese lingerie dealers in Upper Egypt. Um, a piece that I particularly adv admire and I want to draw to your attention appeared about three months ago in The New Yorker. Maybe you saw it. If you didn't, I recommend it to you. Um, it looked at what had happened to some of the students that Peter taught um, in the 90s in China, who grew up in rural poverty and have now become members of the middle class, and the changes they've seen. I thought it was an absolutely marvelous uh, piece. And of course, his early articles in The New Yorker from the, the early moments of the pandemic in China, I think are also must, re <coughs> excuse me, must reading and you can go back to them uh, and find them online if you haven't read them. Before joining the New Yorker, Peter was a Peace Corps volunteer in Fuling, a small Chinese city on the Yangtze River, where he taught English and American literature. The changes that he observed to the economy, to the people, to the geography uh, from China's urbanization fueled three books about the years he spent in the country in his initial stint. River Town, Oracle Bones, which was a National Book Award finalist, and Country Driving was the third of those three books in the, in the trilogy. His book about Egypt, The Buried, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Tonight, what he's going to talk to us about is, the title is Going Back, A Peace Corps Teacher Returns to China After 20 Years. He's going to touch upon the changes that I think he's seen 
including in the natural environment, I think, a little bit, which seems appropriate with, uh, with Earth Day coming up this Friday. Uh, delighted to have him with us, and I ask you now to join me uh, in welcoming Peter Hessler. Good afternoon, and thanks to everybody for being here. I'm very honored to be at the, uh, at the Kennedy School because I think I probably wouldn't have gone to, the, to China without the Peace Corps, which of course was uh, John F. Kennedy's project. So I, 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 I feel no, no, no small amount of gratitude for that. Um, I was wondering if I could have the first image here. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna show some, some pictures as I talk, because I'm talking today about sort of both the past and the present in China. And sometimes these images will help us. I, you know, this first image is from 1996. So this is when I started with the Peace Corps teaching literature um, and English in a place called Fuling, which was in southwestern China, a fairly small place. Um, and my first book was about this experience called Rivertown. Um, and that book was published in 2001. And I, by that point, I had already become a correspondent in Beijing. And I lived in Beijing from 99 to 2007. Um, but in the back of my mind, I always had this idea, what, what would it be like to return to that part of the country and teach again? Um, you know, so I, I kind of had thought about this for a number of years, and I decided that an interval of 20 years made sense um, for a couple of reasons. One is that I have daughters who I knew at that point would be nine years old, um, so not old enough to complain too much. Um, young enough to learn Chinese, we hoped. Um, so my wife and I thought that that would be a good age a good point, but also 20 years was sort of a generation. Um, and especially in China, most of the students that I had taught in the 90s had married relatively young. Um, and I was interested in, in, in seeing what it was like for the next generation and what it would be like to be at a university. Um, people sometimes ask how that book was received in China. And it was something that I thought about a lot when I was writing it um, and preparing to publish it, and that I, I really felt like most Chinese in, in general, and especially people in Fooling, probably would not like it. That was my feeling when I was preparing to publish the book, for a number of reasons. One, I mean, even the title I thought was a bit of a problem, because in China, places often have nicknames, and these nicknames are fairly specific. And like Chongqing, the nearest big city to us, was called Shancheng, the mountain city, and Fooling's nickname was Xiaoshancheng, the little mountain city. Uh, nobody called it Jiangcheng, river town. And that was not a, something you applied. Jiangcheng was Wuhan, and only Wuhan. Um, so it was a little presumptuous as a foreigner to sort of label this place, I, I thought. Um, and it's funny, because in 2020, I, went, I, I did report in Wuhan during the first year of the pandemic, and there was a writer named Fang Fang, who many of you will be familiar with. She's the woman who wrote Wuhan Diary, right? She wrote this very vivid and important documentation of the Wuhan lockdown in the early stages. This incredibly brave woman, almost 70 years old, was, had all kinds of criticism and, and, and pressure put on her. When I was in Wuhan in August of 2020, I met with her. She was kind enough to meet with, with me. And she, you know, this, she had been through this sort of incredible experience. And, and she's a very, you know, very uh, dynamic woman. And we sat down. The first thing she said to me is, you know, Rivertown is Wuhan. <laughs> 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 and I said, I know, I know. Um, you know, it was hard to explain to people that Little Mountain City doesn't sound very good in English. Rivertown sounds a lot better. Um, so that was one issue. But the main issue was that when I lived in Fuling in the 1990s, um, you know, that part of the country was pretty poor. Um, and I was pretty blunt about that in my, in my descriptions. I think on the first page of Rivertown, I said it had always been a poor part of Sichuan province. Um, and I was concerned that people would feel sensitive about this. Um, and so I sort of expected a uh, negative reaction. Um, but it turned out that Rivertown wasn't published in the mainland until 2012. Um, and by then, time had moved so quickly that it was almost as if I'd written about a different place. Um, and people were somewhat nostalgic about the 1990s. The book was published in 2012. In 2014, I went back to Fuling. We have the next image. Um, and they were in the process of building the first uh, golf course in Fooling with a luxury condo development. Um, so they, had, they, they were putting in the greens and they, you know, 
as part of this project, they put in, uh, can we have the next one? The, uh, a full stage, a full size replica of the Segester in Munich, which is a victory arch dedicated to the glory of the Bavarian army. Um, I don't know why this was part of the project, um, but anyway, that was, so you're visiting this, and then uh, can we have the next one? Um, they had named it uh, Rivertown Golf, because it was the next one there, which they even had a Rivertown coat of arms. Um, I, I went in and visited with them. We have the next slide. And uh, <laughs> I went in and talked to the people that were, that were developing this, this huge project, and it was going to have a Marriott and everything. And I said, well, does this have anything to do with my book? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. No, no connection at all. Um, but it was interesting. We have the next one, because when I, the font was actually <laughs> directly copied from the UK edition of the book. Um, so at this point, I realized, okay, people are probably not too upset about this book. Um, you know, and this was in some ways a very Chinese response, very pragmatic. Let's, uh, let's make the most of this. Um, so anyway, in 2017, I applied to teach again in Fuling. I wanted to, to go back to the same place. Um, I still have friends there and colleagues in the department, and I met with them. They were enthusiastic. The college was enthusiastic, and they sent it up to the next level of government in Chongqing, and we waited and waited, and waited, and silence. Um, and sometimes in China, when there's a political rejection, this is how it works. Nobody says anything. It just doesn't happen. Um, so in 2018, I went to Fuling to talk to friends, and I had a friend who was in the party there who was well-connected, um, and he said, you know, you remember what happened in 2012? There was a figure named Bo Xilai, who was the highest Communist Party official in Chongqing. And Bo Xilai was involved in a spectacular scandal in which his wife had had a British businessman murdered. And all this happened in Chongqing, just upstream from Fuling. Um, and as a result, this place was particularly nervous. Can we have the next slide? And one person in particular, which was Xi Jinping, who didn't want any memory of Bo Xilai. And so everybody was tense about this. And it's sort of funny, I, in Rivertown, I wrote about the relationship in a place like that to the leaders. When people talked, to, I think I said something like, it was like coming to a new land and coming to grips with the gods that people worshiped there. The leaders were distant. They didn't necessarily care about you, you would, but they could influence you. They could have a huge impact. People were very conscious. And so when I talked to my friend who was in the party, he, he was sort of very dramatic. And he said, as long as Xi Jinping is in power, you will not teach in fully. And so I said, uh, how is Xi Jinping's health? Um, and well, my, my friend said, uh, yeah, very, very good. And he, <laughs> but his, his solution was, was, was sort of a typical one. We have the next one. Um, in that he said, go across the border. Go out of Chongqing. Try Sichuan. Because um, they had reorganized this. Chongqing was now different, different from Sichuan province. And, and that turned out to be good advice. Often if you cross the border, things can change a little bit. I went to Chengdu, um, the capital of Sichuan, and Sichuan University um, was fine with having me teaching there. Um, so that's how this project got started. Um, and it began in the fall of 2019 when I moved with my family to Chengdu. Um, and there are really two parts to this project. The first was I was interested in seeing what it was like to teach today. We have the next slide. Um, so I was teaching at Sichuan University. This time I was not teaching literature. I was teaching freshman composition, but then also nonfiction writing. Um, and I was really curious about what the current generation of young people would be like and how they reminded me of people in the past. Um, you know, the, just even from the very beginning, the differences were so striking. I mean, in the old days, almost all of my students came from the countryside. Um, for example, when I taught my nonfiction class, not one of them was from a rural background. They were all city people. In the old days, my students came from big families. When I surveyed, in my second year teaching in the Peace Corps, I had a class of freshmen, and I surveyed them, and only one was from a one-child family. Because in those days, the policy had not really been implemented very strictly in rural areas. In 2019, when I surveyed a class of 14 freshmen, there was only one kid with siblings. Um, you know, and so, so that sort of changed. But there were other changes as well, if we have the next slide. And, and sometimes I would, I would joke with my students, I would show them pictures often of, of of the 1990s, this is for me teaching, and I would say, well, what's changed? Um, and they would talk about the way people dress and so on. And I was like, well, look at me. I've, 
how did I become so short? Because um, <laughs> I was towering over my students, and I'll get to the next slide, um, and then the students today, <laughs> you know, and this was one of the things, I mean, it's, so, it's such a visceral thing to be in the classroom, and the physicality of your students is totally different. And this would happen when I visited people I taught. Go to the next slide. Um, this is a young, this is a woman I taught in the 90s and her son. And look at the next one, too. This, so almost always it's like this. You know, they're like a head taller. Um, you know, and, and this is, uh, in, in 2020, the Lancet published a study that um, out of 200 countries, China has seen the largest increase in boys' height and the third largest in girls' height since 1985. So the average Chinese 19-year-old male is uh, more than three and a half inches tall because of improved nutrition, you know. And so this is the sort of thing that just from the moment you're there, you feel this as a teacher. Um, and so they were, you know, when, my, when I showed these to my students, they were kind of looking at photos of their parents in a way. Uh, if we go to the next one, one of the students I taught in fooling of the name Lucy, um, she, you can see on the top of that she wrote Jamar, which is like relative because her name was the same as mine, the family name. Um, next slide. Her son was a student at Sichuan University when I taught there. So it really was like the next generation. Um, so this also led me to the second part of my project. In addition to being interested in what it was like to teach now, I, I wanted to, to go back to fooling as often as possible and to reconnect with the people I had taught in the 1990s and to sort of see some of the ways in which their lives had changed. And it made me think a lot more about that moment in the 1990s, which I think is a really critical moment um, in China's history. Um, when I lived there, I was 27 when I went to Fuling. Um, go to the next slide. And you know, even though I was quite young, it was a sort of the place where you did think about time a lot, e even at that moment, um, because we were on the Yangtze and because there was a sense of change. This is an image of looking down this is 1996 again, looking down on the Yangtze River from a mountain to the north to the main part of Fuling that you can see behind. And if you look there, you can see that boat. And then above that is a narrow strip in the water. That's a strip of sandstone that was called the uh, Bai He Liang, the White Crane Ridge. We'll go to the next slide. And this was something that appeared only in the winter. In the winter when the river dropped, this ridge would emerge. And it was, it was a low strip of sandstone. And they would have, the archaeological bureau would have a guy out there. You can kind of see an image of a guy waving. That was Huang Dejian, who was a guy whose job was to sit out there in a PLA coat. And he's just freezing cold in the river with the wind coming through. But he would be out there. because Occasionally, they would have visitors. Almost nobody went out there, though, of course, because there's no, no real tourism in Fuling. But he was there, and he was very knowledgeable about the thing. Um, go to the next one. Um, and so when you go on that ridge, it's covered with calligraphy and carvings. And this developed more than 1,000 years ago because boatsmen who were going downstream would look at that ridge and check it, and then that would tell them what the river rapids would be like in the three gorges downstream. So it was an important gauge. At one point, they, they carved two fish into the stone, and then they would know when the fish appeared. And then it became a tradition to put calligraphy in it. Um, and, and to document, so it became very artistic and cultural, as, as well as a, a navigation device. Um, go to the next one. Um, and that this sense of continuity was really amazing. This, this, this picture is from January 30th, 1998. Um, and on that day, the river was two inches higher than it had been in 763, uh, in the Tang Dynasty. Uh, so two inches in more than 1,200 years. Um, so you really had this sense of cycles. Um, and this, this, this thing having been there for a long time. But we also were very much aware that this was not permanent. The next slide. Because when you went through town, you also saw these signs. And this was the level of the future reservoir because we were in the region of the Three Gorges Dam. Now, Fooling was pretty far upstream from the dam, so it wasn't going to be totally flooded like most places. But low-lying parts of the city were going to be moved and we were, they also were going to move in a lot of people from other communities that were getting flooded. Um, and this was going to start happening in 2003. In the 1990s, people didn't talk about that much. It still seemed pretty far away. But you often wonder what was going to happen, for example, to that ridge. And there were some articles in the paper about it. One of the things I talked about was possibly building an underwater museum. Um, 
you know, and in Rivertown, I, I wrote about this, and I said that they, th those articles all, always emphasized, well, we have another option, which is just to make a bunch of rubbings. And I wrote, uh, this would undoubtedly be the more practical solution. The region simply didn't have the sort of resources necessary to build an underwater exhibition chamber. I mean, this sort of thing seemed impossible to protect these. I mean, this was a town that uh, in those days had no railroad. There was no highway. You took the boat. Um, there wasn't a single stoplight in town. I didn't know anybody who owned a car. Um, you know, it was a pretty simple and, and, and fairly undeveloped part of the country. Um, and uh, so we were very focused on life there. Let's go to the next image. Um, this was a view from my, from my bedroom at that time. Um, you can see the pollution. Uh, you can also see kind of in the distance one big building. So there was a sense that development was starting to happen, but it was still on the distant horizon. Move to the next image. Um, and it, it was sort of similar with the people that I taught. Um, you could tell that, that this was sort of a unique generation. Most of them had been born in the mid-70s. So that meant that they were born around the time that Mao Zedong died. Um, and they had grown up with the changes that Deng Xiaoping initiated beginning in 1978, reform and opening. Um, we can go to the next one. Um, most of them, when they wrote about their families, many of their grandparents, had, their grandmothers had bound feet. It was common for their parents to be illiterate. But they were becoming educated. They represented a new generation. Um, and when they looked back 20 years, they were looking back at the Cultural Revolution, 1996 and 1976. Sometimes I asked them to write about their families. Um, and one of them, a woman wrote, can we have the, the next slide? One of them wrote about uh, her parents. She said, uh, it was the great cultural revolution then, and my parents only did what they were ordered to do, and they didn't consider whether they were true or false. Today, when we see those days with our own sight, we feel our parents' thoughts and actions are somewhat blind and fanatical. But if we consider that time objectively, I think we should understand and can understand that. Each generation has its own happiness and sadness. To the younger generation, the important thing is understanding instead of criticizing. Our elder generation was unlucky didn't own a good chance and circumstance to realize their value. But their spirit, their love for our country, set a good example for us. They often wrote beautifully. I felt in many ways their writing was what best communicated who, who they were. In, in person, they were often shy. They had not met a foreigner before we taught them. And they were often uncomfortable with spoken English. Um, and they came across often as, as seeming very young. I often had to remind myself that, that these kids were really not much younger than me. Um, and I realized over time that part of that sort of their youthfulness was because they were entering such a new world. At that time, when you were a Chinese student from the countryside and you entered university, your hukou, or household registration, automatically transitioned to urban status. You became a city person, officially, on, your, on, on, on paper. And this was the transition they were starting to make. But of course, it was new. They were uncomfortable with this new world. They were figuring it out. Um, and in many cases, they were hiding, or, or they, weren't, they weren't talking so openly about how, hard, how much of a struggle this was. And often I didn't learn until later. There was one boy who wrote me in 2014, and he apologized for not having been a more attentive student. He wrote, for three years at the college, I did not eat well and sleep well. I remember in 1996, for half a year, I just had one meal a day. I was a sad man, but now I'm happy about my life. So I, I learned more in the years since often about what they had gone through. They were, they were being trained as English teachers, and after graduation, they were sent to teach, usually in middle schools. This was part of an expansion of the Chinese education system. Um, these were solid, stable jobs, but they didn't pay a lot. $40 a month was about the average. What's the next one? Um, so as I was leaving Fuling, I realized that I wanted to find a way to stay in touch with them. So I prepared these books. You're seeing pages from them where each of the students would put a picture, and sometimes they wrote a message, but they wrote their address. Um, in those days, we didn't have cell phones. Uh, nobody was on internet. Um, I wanted to be able to keep in touch with them, so I had all the students write. This was a student named Jimmy, um, who was a very lively kid. Um, and so. And when I left Fooling in 1998, I didn't know I was going to be going to Beijing within a year. Um, and we weren't really sure when we would see each other. So I had them fill out these books. And the students sometimes had us prepare mementos. And Studi uh, Jimmy came by my, my apartment one evening with a cassette tape. And he asked me to make a recording. He said, I want you, 
um, to read the poetry that we studied in literature class. He said, especially I want you to read The Raven and anything by Shakespeare. This is so I can remember your class. And I was very touched, and I told him I would, I would do it that evening. And he, and he said, also, after you finish the poems, I want you to say all the bad words you know in English and put, them, <laughs> and put them on the tape. Even if there's some bad words you haven't taught us yet, I want you to put them on. So, so, so Adam and I did that. Um, so so there were, most of the students went into teaching, but there were some who went into the private economy. If we have the next slide. Um, and this was a difficult choice because nothing was guaranteed. And often the students who, who turned down the teaching jobs, who, who, be, who tried to find their way in the new private economy, often they were some of the poorer students. Uh, there's a boy there you can see to the left of me, North. He was the uh, class monitor. Most of these kids had chosen their own English names. And North chose his name because Beijing is to the north, and that's where authority is from. And he'd heard that there was a British prime minister named North. Um, although he didn't understand that it was the Earl of Guilford who basically lost the American colonies. Um, but he was North, and he was the class monitor. Of, and, and, uh, and then the boy to the right was his roommate named Young Si, which was a sort of a transliteration of his, uh, of his Chinese poet, poet name. Um, and these were two of the boys who decided they wanted to find their own path, to find their own way. And another one of their roommates, we'll look at the next slide, he was also saw himself as a poet, the boy to the left. This is what he was performing Shakespeare in, in my class in this photo. And he chose the English name Henri, A-N-R-Y, because he believed that a poet should be angry as well as romantic. And he dropped the G so it wouldn't be too direct. Um, but Henri was in some ways sort of typical of the kids who went away to find their own path in that, so he was the youngest of four siblings. This was common in my classes to have a, a child who had, was at the end of a family line, be, partly because things had changed or that the younger one now had a chance at college, although it was still rare. Only six out of every hundred young people of this generation could enter college. So it, was, it was still very unusual. But sometimes the family, so they had invested their resources in this kid. This is another almost mirror image with the teaching recently when I was at Sichuan University. The few students I had who had siblings were almost always the oldest because the policy changed in 2015. Sometimes the parents had had a, a younger sibling, the one-child policy, after it changed. But in this case, so Henri was pretty typical. He had his brother, his third brother, had dropped out of school to help support Henri's education, took a job in the factory world. His oldest brother worked um, in the local government um, for, uh, in road construction. And for, as part of that job, he had access to dynamite. And sometimes he would take some dynamite out and go to a lake and drop it in the lake and pick up the fish that floated to the surface. Um, th this, was, this was not uncommon in the 1990s, dynamite fishing. You would see signs telling people not to do it uh, because, of course, like every once in a while, somebody would get caught with a short fuse. And that's what happened with Henri's brother. And when it happened, he was holding the dynamite. And it blew off both of his hands and blinded him. And this happened the month that Henri graduated. So at that point, he knows that he has to support his brother, his brother's wife, and his brother's young son. Um, and that added pressure. He felt like he could not afford to take the teaching job. So he went off as a migrant to try to find work. He went to Kunming. He tried various sales jobs, didn't have success. And in the end, he ended up going to Shanghai. And by the time he arrived in Shanghai, he had $3 left and a contact there. So some of these kids were taking amazing risks. Of course, I didn't learn a lot about this until later. Um, you know, but I was trying to keep in contact with them. Um, and so about every, I moved back to Beijing in 1999, and every six months or so, basically every semester, I would write all of my students a letter. And then they would often write, write me back. And recently I went through all of these, you know, I have stacks of these letters. And this was the way we stayed in touch until it became possible to do it electronically. In the early years, a lot of what I would get were reports on, on their marriages. Um, the first year, one of them wrote and said, last winter I was married with a doctor. He is not very handsome, <laughs> but he is very kind to me. Next spring we will have a baby. Another classmate of, her, of, of hers wrote, what makes me happy is that I married an ugly woman who graduated from the math department of Fooling Teachers College. Another student wrote, now I find a girlfriend finally. She will be my wife after 2000. She isn't beautiful. There are many black points on her face. 
but I love her because she has more money than me. <laughs> I had never really known that there were so many unattractive people in Sichuan <laughs> province and, until my students started to get married. You know, this was, this is like a very, I, I associate this as a very rural quality, which is, it's actually a little bit like in Egypt where they have the evil eye. You don't want to take too much pleasure in something. It's safer to, don't tell me that your wife is beautiful. Say that she's ugly. Don't, you don't want to draw bad luck. This is a very rural quality. So it was funny, I would get all these letters. I mean, and we would always joke about this in the Peace Corps. People, people was like, oh, oh, you have a girlfriend? What? She's like, oh, she's very ugly. They would always say, <laughs> just sort of shocking for an American. Um, uh, Jimmy, the next slide. So Jimmy was one of the ones who, uh, who married pretty smart. Um, his wife was a very dynamic woman who ran a small hotel in his town. Um, and uh, she became the Hewlett Packard representative for the region pretty early on. And so they were one of the very few who figured out, this is when I visited them after their child had been born, they figured out how to have a second child, how to, how to get around the system. Very few of their classmates did that. Almost all of them just had one children, had just, just had one child. Um, so while I was living in Beijing, I would often write them and visit them. But in 2007, I left China, and then I ended up in Egypt for a number of years. And so at that point, our communication was mostly by email. Um, but I, I kind of, at that point, my books had come out, my students had read them, and I wanted to sort of, I felt like I could do surveys with them because we have a high level of trust and it would help me sort of get a better understanding of the ways in which their lives have changed. So since then, since 2014, I've often given them surveys. And usually I get about 30 students or so who respond. And it helps me sort of see the ways in which their lives have changed. Um, go to the next slide. So, you know, um, but that's a picture of Jimmy and, uh, his child a little bigger. Next one. Um, so the economics, you can see some of the details there. At the beginning, they were usually making about 500 a year. In 2014, when I surveyed them, the median household income was nearly 18,000. And last year, when I asked the question again, it had risen to 35,000. Um, so there's sort of this remarkable rise. And almost all of them, even by 2014, I think there was only one who didn't have both an apartment and a car. Um, and uh, they were also quite satisfied with their careers. Um, when I asked them to rate their job satisfaction on a scale of 1 to 10, of the teachers, the ones who were teaching, the average response was 7.9, which I found very striking. I mean, the, imagine if you asked a, a group of American teachers. Um, it's also striking to me that almost more than 90% of them are still teaching. Another you know, type of stability that, that I, I don't think you'd see also. But it's interesting. Even though all these changes, look at the next picture. So when I visit them now, they look very much like urban middle class people. You know, they're, they're obviously prosperous. It's totally different from the images they had before. But they don't always see it that way. In 2014, I asked them to define their social class. I just left it open-ended. And uh, only 8 out of 30 identified as middle class or higher. 22 define themselves with terms like proletariat, low class, down class, poverty class, poor. One wrote, we belong to nothing. There was one boy who made $80,000 US a year, owned three apartments and one car. He wrote, we belong to lower class. There's, you know, this was interesting to me. I think there's a couple of things going on. One is that there's not a long tradition of having a middle class in China. This is a new phenomenon. So people, and, and there are studies that show that people are slowly becoming more more inclined to identify them as middle class. But it's also, I think, that the experience of being poor stays with people. You know, they, they, don't, they, 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 they don't feel necessarily as prosperous as we might expect. That memory, those memories are very intense. You think about somebody like David, who ate one meal a year, you know, when he was 19 years old. He's not going to forget that. Um, and there are many ways in which I recognize them still. They still remind me of rural people. Um, some of those old things, and even old traditions. Like when we were in Fuling, um, the students, of course, were indoctrinated in Marxism, and they were, they were very strong atheists. You would never try to mention anything about religion in class. Um, and they tend to be very dismissive of it. So it surprised me in 2016 when I surveyed them, 27 out of 33 respondents said they believed in God. And when I asked, do you believe in Bao Ying, the, the Buddhist concept of karmic retribution, 28 out of 33 did. And when I asked if they had visited a place of worship during the previous year, a clear majority of 23 had done that. And that was really surprising to me. But some of these old traditions return. 
You know, they, they, they run even deeper than the educational system. I often met with the, uh, the, those three roommates, uh, North, Henri, and Youngsi, all of whom ended up in the private economy, and all of them found jobs that were connected in one way or another with the urbanization. Um, North um, developed the specialty, uh, go to the next one. Um, so North in the last 10 years has developed a specialty of putting elevators onto buildings. The population of Fooling has in, in, in increased from 200,000 when I first lived there to 600,000. There was a lot of construction that was very inexpensive, especially in the early 2000s. And as North tells me, he said, people are getting older in China. The population's aging. And then people aren't going to want to walk up 12 flights of stairs anymore. And so he goes to buildings and puts on elevators. Go to the next one. And next one. And uh, this is sort of, an, you know, he, of course, he's not an engineer. And I was surprised when I heard that he was doing this. But then I spent some time with him on the job. And he did have an engineer who does the technical stuff. But so much of it is political, which is what North was always good at. Because in order to do this, you have to negotiate with all of the residents. And he sets up a fee structure. And you pay more if by every floor, it pays more. And you have to get a key. And if you refuse to pay, you don't get a key. You can't use the elevator. And he spends a huge amount of time. And he's a very, North was always incredibly patient. He, he, he was a very, very good at dealing with people. And this, is, this makes sense for him as a specialty. Go, go to the next one. Um, so Henri is on the right. North is in the middle. Henri was the one whose brother was hurt. When he went to Shanghai, he was fortunate. He quickly found a job because of his English. And he ended up doing some stuff in management. He started taking night classes. And he studied something called Six Sigma, which is uh, a manufacturing process that was developed by Motorola that was to try to make things safer, make production lines safer and, and more predictable. And he became obsessed with this and studied it and became a consultant who, who presented to factories all around the East Coast about how to institute this process, which he said nobody, nobody would have basic protocols. They didn't have basic training. And so he was teaching factories how to do this. And he's very proud that he's played some role in making things safer, but it's very personal to him. That brother that I mentioned who dropped out of school to help, um, to help pay for it, he died in an industrial accident on a, uh, on a production floor in Shanghai. So for, for, for Henri, this is a very personal, very meaningful type of work. And Young Si, who's there on the left, had the most spectacular success. So he started out selling cell phones um, in 1999, when they were just starting to become um, common for, for, for people who had some money. He also sold walkie-talkies, which he didn't, he just had some on stock. He didn't expect that to be a, a moneymaker, but for, he noticed that people were buying them, buying them, buying them. They were flying off the shelves. And he realized what happens is if you have a construction site, you use walkie-talkies. You expand the construction site, you get more workers, you need more walkie-talkies. You go back to the same guy to get him on the same frequency. And he realized this was a totally unexploited niche. He ended up opening several shops that did this around the region. He dominated the market. Then he moved into other things, parking lots, parking lot management systems, um, you know, surveillance cameras, and then advertising. And he's become sort of a tycoon. Go to the next picture. When I visited them last year, he was driving us around in his $150,000 Mercedes S350. Uh, and this is somebody who was you know, poor 20 years ago. Um, so this, you know, th th he's probably the most spectacular but the, the, you know, the general trend, of course, is common. There are more than 800 million Chinese who were lifted out of poverty since Deng Xiaoping's reforms. Um, so at Sichuan University, um, I sometimes describe what it was like in Fuling when I was teaching my younger students. Um, go to the next one. Uh, so that's, that's in today's classroom, which is, you know, has all the tech stuff, including, if you look above me, the surveillance camera, which is... Uh, in almost, every, in almost every classroom in China. Um, and I would talk to them about the past. And I, I read them, for example, that comment by the student in Fuling who talked about her parents' generation and, 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 not to, and to be objective. And I asked them, well, can you, how would you describe your own parents? Um, one boy wrote, but to be objective, my parents are both the victims and the injurers. My parents sometimes hope that I will become a civil servant because that job usually has a low workload and good income. And most importantly, a civil servant can sometimes take bribes. Ironically, this generally happens when CCTV broadcasts that some government worker has just been arrested for taking bribes. 
While my parents curse the government worker, they also hope that I will become that government worker. Sometimes my mother hopes that I'll become a doctor because if I'm a doctor, then I can make money by selling medicine. And I believe that when she talks about this, she forgets the time she's been fooled for, to buy useless medicine. But there's an old Chinese saying, once you've been bitten by snakes, you'll be afraid of strings for 10 years. My parents may be hurt when they were young, so they keep vigilant, but sometimes they admire the snakes which bit them. Um, this was also a connection I noticed because when I, when I did a survey in 2017, I asked my students, do you frequently have contact with government officials? Give the next slide. Um, and out of 30 people who responded, 26 said that they did not have frequent contact. And a number of them commented that they don't like to deal with them. Like, for example, Jimmy. Jimmy wrote, I have some friends from the government. I don't like them. They are not able, and they are capable of nothing. <laughs> then I asked the next question. Would you want your child to pursue a career in government service? Can we have the next slide? 21 out of 30 said yes. Jimmy wrote, I don't like government men, but I like the job. I hope my kid could get a job as an official. The job is not hard and rewarding. There's often this, this sense of contradiction um, that, that you feel in China today. Um, I think as Americans, this is one of the hardest things to grasp. We see this incredible economic, social, and cultural changes, and we wonder why has there not been a corresponding political change? How is it possible that the politics have stayed so much the same and in some ways have even become aggressive? And I think this is a really logical response as an outsider. But it's also logical the way that many Chinese think about it. I mean, I think it's common for people, especially maybe people like my students, to think that the stability of the political system has allowed them to have this economic, social, and cultural change. Um, I think that's also logical. You can understand why people would think that way. And, and they understand how the system works. They, under, they have benefited from it, but they also understand the flaws. Um, that's one of the things that I've noticed over the years is you're watching these people who I remember as being very shy and naive, becoming city people, also becoming very adept at this system. Go to the next picture. Um, like Jimmy, when I go visit, when I visited Jimmy recently, one unfortunate thing about Jimmy, he lives on the top floor of that building. And you are not gonna notice this, but if you were north looking at that building, that's an elevator proof building. Because you can't put an elevator down because it goes in front of the shop there. So Jimmy was bummed out. So, and it, this is all these students, when they need, have elevator issues, they call north. And so he's always, when I, would, when I talk to him about another student, he's like, yeah, that guy's in a building. It's really complicated to put an elevator in there. And you know, he's, he's always, and, and that was Jimmy's situation. But Jimmy, go uh, to the next one. Um, Jimmy and his wife are, are, are some of the people who are very adept at figuring things out. When I saw them the last time, um, when I was there in 2021, um, there had just recently in the last, in 2018, Xi Jinping um, expressed concern about the damage that intense study could do to, to school children's eyes. There's always these random things that come up. And he said, we should protect our children's eyes together, giving them a bright future. And then in 2021, he announced a project called the Guangming Xingdong which is like Operation Light or Project Light. The moment that happens, Jimmy, go to the next slide. Jimmy and his wife start manufacturing LED lights for classrooms. To, you know, and that's, so, so they just, they, they, they've learned how to do this. They've learned how to, how to respond quickly uh, to these things. Go to the next one. Um, but in the process of, of watching them and living, you know, sort of seeing them at different stages, you can understand how they come to these realizations, how, how they grow as people. I'm teaching the younger people um, was quite fascinating because that memory that I had of the 90s of the students feeling very young, very naive, is not the way that I felt about the current generation of students. Um, they, they, you know, I, I thought of them as old souls. They had sort of, they, they, they arrived sort of fully formed. They understood how things worked. One of the students, uh, a sophomore girl, when she wrote about her parents, this is what she wrote. My parents were born in the 1970s. And I think they now fit into the lower middle class in China. They are characterized by firm patriotism and nonchalant cynicism. They strongly support the People's Republic of China, not by praising Chinese government, but by criticizing foreign governments. They refuse to use Apple products, decline to travel to Japan, and dismiss Trump as crazy and malicious. Yet they seldom admire China with passion. They have witnessed corruption in Chinese bureaucracy as well as injustice in society to which they are not able to address, and they say things are just like that. I think my generation, born in the age of the internet, is puzzled and somehow depressed by the conflict between Western beliefs and Chinese beliefs. Propaganda about liberty and reason prevails on the internet, 
while that about patriotism and communism prevails in the textbooks. Youngsters are mostly attracted by the former, but when passing exams and pursuing jobs, they should bear in mind the latter. And in practice in China, more often than not, the latter functions better. Um, when I go back, I visit people like Jimmy. I always also go to the, the site of Rivertown Golf. Um, and the last time I was there, let's go to the next image. Um, that was back in 2014. Then I went there last year and uh, go to the next one. Um, so one of the things that, she, another Xi Jinping campaign what turned out to be the anti-golf campaign, uh, which was they decided that golf was a waste of resources and also that it was a, a hotbed of corruption and especially any golf course that had been approved under Bo Xilai. <laughs> and Rivertown Golf, it turned out, was approved under Bo Xilai. Go to the next slide. So every time I go back, they're trying to find something different <laughs> to do with the golf course, like they barbecue, go to the next one. They do some uh, you know, Mongolian horse riding <laughs> on the grasslands in the next one. Um, go to ATVs in the next one. Um, and mostly it just comes back to the countryside. People have started planting crops on Rivertown Golf. I went back in the office and uh, go to the next slide. Oh, that's the Marriott, which is not a Marriott. Um, and the next one. And the F has fallen off Rivertown Golf, um, off the side. <laughs> but, and then when you, go, when, you, when you go down there looking on the river, next one, you can see the development of the town and how much it's uh, changed. And you go into town, go to the next slide, and uh, there's this big museum there. Next one. You go down a huge escalator. Go to the next one. You look out a porthole. Next slide. And there's the White Crane Ridge, 200 feet below the water. So they ended up building that, uh, that underwater museum, which I, when I wrote Rivertown, I thought was just impossible. That they would, it was a $34 million museum. Um, next one. And the, the guy who used to sit on, on the, he's still there. He's the director of it. Now he's the director of this $34 million museum, <laughs> Huang Dujian. Often he has like two cell phones that he's jugging. There's pictures of him with all the leaders who come there and visit. Uh, so often this is the way it is. It's the same people. <laughs> They're just doing different things, and they've changed in certain ways. So there is a sort of conjunction of, of past and present all the, all, all the time. Um, I'd like to stop there. So we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so uh, yeah, so if there's anything about, and I, I may show, show some more images in, in, in connection to the questions, but let's go ahead and get, I think we have two, two microphones, right, if people want to ask questions that you can go up to. Or you can just, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you so much for being here. I was born very close to Fuling. I was raised in Sichuan, uh, Chongqing and Sichuan. So it's very nice to see an old friend here at the Kennedy School. Um, my question is, how did you, um, comparing your teaching experiences um, 20 years ago in Fuling versus um, just a couple of years ago in Sichuan, do you think, um, is it harder to, or is it harder to teach the Western value to the younger generation in um, in China, and how does the how how do they criticize or how do they evaluate the Western society, Western system with their critical thinking um, type of mind? Yeah, no, I mean, I you know, I had I had some reservations about teaching because I was for one thing the the experience in the '90s had been so positive and so sort of inspiring. I wasn't sure if this would be a disappointment, but I you know I found that sort of I was surprised. You know, I was very very much engaged by the students. I was really impressed with them. Um, and I, I think that, I think sometimes our view of young people in China is that they're hyper-nationalistic. That's not at all actually my impression. Um, I felt like actually the students in the 90s to me were more nationalistic. They just didn't have the same outlet so they weren't like Shaofenhong, like the uh, little pinks online, um, you know. But, but I found that these students, and it's kind of, I mean, one thing that's a, that I'm really interested in is, I mean, there's so much, many more students going overseas, right? I mean, recently, I'm working on a piece where I was communicating with students that I taught in Sichuan University. One of them, I've just, she's in Sierra Leone, one's in the Netherlands, one's in Texas. You know, they're just all over the place. 
Um, so it's a different generation. So while this, I found this in generally, obviously this is a time of, of pretty dark politics when we look at China. Um, it's a hard time. I found this experience to give me some, a little more optimism. Um, if I could follow up with one more question. Uh, a lot of my friends who know about you were very disheartened to know that you were leaving Sichuan last year. Uh, my question is, um, if in 10 or 20 years, would you go back to that area? Or if yes, what would bring you back? If no, what would you pre prevent you from going back? Yeah, I mean, we wanted to stay, but you know, it's a difficult time politically and my job was not renewed. Um, so we didn't have a choice. We originally had planned to be there for five years. Um, no, no, I would very much like to be there again at some point. You know, it's, and you know, my father's a sociologist and so I grew up with the idea of longitudinal studies and, and sort of following things over time. And that's part of why I kept in touch with the students the way I did, because you learn more. You know, you, when you see things unfold, uh, it gives you sort of a, a, a different texture to replace. Um, so yeah, no, I, this is I, uh, an area that I hope to stay connected to in the future. Thank Thanks. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much for coming to talk to us. Uh, my question is, I think when we talk about the growing middle class in China, uh, we also often think about the rise in consumerism. And when we think about this sort of new wealth that has accompanied economic growth, we don't necessarily see the same degree of educational attainment that flows with that new gain in wealth. And that might just be due to gaps in people or like society having to take time to develop that cultural uh, and like larger phenomenon of the entire population being more educated and having more access to higher like, institutions of, of uh, learning. So when you think about China today, uh, how do you reconcile those two things with economic growth, not necessarily aligning to, you know, both mentality growth, as you described, how poverty remains in your conscience when you experience poverty at a young age, and also the, how like, education hasn't quite caught up to the entire population. I think, the, I mean, you know, as I said, it was six out of every hundred in, in, in the mid-90s would go to college, and now it's 48 out of every hundred. So that's, that is fairly impressive, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a huge increase. Um, so I think there have been, it's interesting though, those students that I taught, they're quite negative about the education system actually. Uh, again, it's contradictory. They're negative about this, and they often say what we teach is junk food. The stuff in the textbooks is not useful. But as I said, they have a high job satisfaction and they've stayed in those jobs. There's no way that if you had American who were being trained as teachers in the 1990s, that 90% of them would still be teaching today and would have a job satisfaction average of 7.9, right? So these, both these things are happening, right? And this is the way so many things are, I think, in China, that you do have both sides. I find education, I tip a little more toward the optimism. Like I do feel like this has been a real strength for China. And it's one of the things that makes me a little more hopeful. Um, because even though there, it's a hugely flawed system, you do encounter lots of people who can, you know, who, 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 who can think and who can write. I mean, the, 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 those words that I read are beautifully written, right? I mean, the one, and I'm not editing that. I mean, that's the way she wrote. Um, and it wasn't uncommon. Um, I also find that it still is true that even people with low education level in China try to push their kids, you know, which uh, is another strength. And I mean, here in the US, sometimes it's like, if, I don't, if I'm not educated, who am I to encourage my child, right? There's sometimes a little bit of that sense. In China, that's never the case, you know. My students' parents had no education, but they valued it, even if they couldn't read. You know, and so th these are strengths, um, I think, that hopefully will lead to something better. Thanks. Hello, my question has to do with your success in sort of centering your life around these so-called longitudinal studies. Um, when you were reading the works, they, I just found them so personal and so intriguing and engaging, and, I've, and I think that's rare um, nowadays to sort of establish those connections that go deeper beyond your job as a teacher or as a professor. And I think it's a skill that um, is helpful in any field, whether that's journalism, whether it's investigating, teaching, or writing. So I'm just curious as to what you see as the key to establishing that connection that can last a lifetime. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I was very fortunate to be sent to a place like that. I mean, some of it was not my choice or um, these were manageable sized communities in a way, you know, and at that time it was not very common for foreigners to end up in a place like that. Um, and really the timing was also right because even five years earlier that wouldn't have happened. You know, they weren't able to send people to, to places like Fuling. And so it was kind of, you know, it was hard because they were small, 
But once you got through past the language barrier and so on, you could make a kind of connections there that I think may have been harder in bigger cities. And people were really open. I mean, I'm very grateful. I mean, you know, these students have been so generous over the years. And it's almost, you know, it's, I, it's a nice relationship because, of course, I, you know, they know exactly what I'm doing. And I, I send them all, the, all my stories. Um, and it's, you know, we talk about it as well, you know, what I'm, what I'm working on, what I'm researching. Um, and that side of it has also helped me, you know, um, I think uh, stay engaged and, and stay connected with them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello. <clears throat> uh, given all your experiences in China, I was wondering, uh, do you have any recommendations for U.S. policymakers today uh, in, or in terms of navigating uh, the U.S. relationship with China? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, this is obviously a pretty, pretty, pretty terrible, terrible moment in U.S.-China relations. Um, you know, I, I think we have to try to do a better job of maintaining the connections like the Peace Corps, which was cut, like the Fulbright program, which was cut. Um, I just don't think these are risks to the United States. I think we should be more confident about being open with exchanges. I don't think we have anything to lose. And that was always my approach as a teacher. I mean, it was amazing to me when the Peace Corps was being pulled out that there would be articles saying that they were you know, worried about you know, I saw stuff in some of the conservative press in the U.S. worried about the Peace Corps volunteers uh, being turned to communist agents while we were, you know, it's just like, have you spent any time, you know, like, I don't know, it's like the last thing I would have been interested in, and it's like, and the propaganda is so clumsy in China, it's like, you have to have a little more confidence than that, right? And it used to be the Chinese who were worried about us being ACA agents, which is in some ways a reasonable worry, or about us disrupting, the, which we did, we always disrupted things. Being a foreigner in these places, you disrupt it, right? And I did the same thing at Sichuan University. It's one reason why I'm not teaching there right now. Um, but that's in our interest, you know? Um, so I, I think that's, a, that's you know, something that, I've, that I feel passionately about. Um, it is a tough moment. It's a tough relationship right now. But I, you know, I, I, I think uh, that's something that, that, that I, I hope we work on. I'm glad to see that there are still Chinese students coming to the US. That's better than nothing. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, I was curious, in one of the pictures you showed, there was the camera in the classroom. I was wondering, with the kind of new methods of technology and surveillance um, from the Chinese state, whether you're seeing a material impact in behavior amongst your students or kind of the population more broadly, you know, perhaps that's attentiveness in the classroom, but also other kinds of behavior. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I was always keeping track of those things because you do notice, I mean, it really jumps out at you. I mean, I counted my local subway station and there are a hundred surveillance <laughs> cameras in the in, in the in the in one subway station you know um, and they're either all over the school and stuff I mean as to how it impacts behavior I mean I, I think people just tune it out in some ways you know and I, I can't you know so it is it's, it's a funny thing and it's weird like when I went to Wuhan in August of 2020 to report there and I met with people like Fang Fang and others I really I'm pretty sure I was not being tailed very carefully um, and you kind of know because you meet people repeatedly. I met some people repeatedly. And if you do that, usually the second meeting, they're like, Bufang uh, Bien, you know, or, you know, like, they'll, they'll tell you that they can't meet if somebody's come in and told them, hey, you know. So it's weird. I mean, I, I found that in many cases, I was able to do good reporting and was able to go to places even that were fairly sensitive. So I think there's always gaps in, this kind of, in these kind of systems. Um, my students did not feel terrified. I would always tell them, you know, if you want something to private, you can give it to me on a file directly instead of putting it through email or any of the systems. And some of them would do that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it's something that I was always thinking about. And in the, in the end, a lot of it's a mystery to you, like how closely you're, you're being monitored and, and so on, yeah. Thanks. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, my question is really short. Um, <laughs> After engaging with China for so long, what are some stories that you think still need to be told? Um, and, and anything missing from the narratives that are being told right now? I mean, now? I always like, you know, I th always think it's good to get into the interior of China. You know, we see a lot more of Beijing and Shanghai. Um, I think, uh, you know, at this point, it's really hard for journalists to do any kind of work there because there's, you know, a lot of journalists were kicked out and the pandemic restrictions have made it hard for people to get in. And so the ones who are there are so overworked, they can't really do long form stories. And it really, you know, China is the kind of place that I think you need to do like long projects 
is often the way that you can kind of capture this nuance. Because as you can tell from a lot of things I'm talking about, it's not cut or dry, it's, it's not black and white. Um, and in a long story, in the New Yorker type of story, I can do that. But it's very hard for journalists in Beijing now to, to get that time, to get, to get that space. And they're so understaffed that they're, you know, that they, they're just trying to cover the news, basically. So it's, it's a shame. I mean, this does concern me. I'm also concerned because we have a whole generation of people like a lot of people here who are students, who are in, in people doing research, who can't go in right now. And I'm concerned that we might lose a generation of young people who were like me in the, in the 1990s, who would need to be making those connections and they, making their early start. So I, I, I hope we can get to a point where that's possible. But it, it all is just, just contact. The time you can spend on the ground is what it comes down to. There's no, you know, there's no shortcuts, basically. Hi, thank you so much, and welcome to the forum. Um, my question is, after you saw the Geiger Kaifang reforms take hold, did you notice a shift in whether your students went into the private sector, into high salary, high pressure jobs, or whether they kept going into more public sector, stable, but low pressure jobs? Yeah, most of them stayed teaching. You know, most of them have decided the job is high status, it pays well enough. The, the pay, as you can tell from the data that I had, the, the salaries have gone up. Uh, North was one of the few, he was, for a while was in a state-owned enterprise job that was pretty stable, and then he took that jump to, to do the elevator business. But at this point, not too many of them are jumping because now it's highly competitive. It's, it's hard now to sort of find your niche. And that's the other thing that I'm really conscious of in China is this intense competitiveness, right? And, and Chinese people talk about neijuan, like involution, this really kind of self-defeating competition. It's a word that my students, I mean, I had not heard that word before, and then my first semester I started hearing it, and it was a huge part of the, of the discussion. And it's something that I'm writing about in, 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 in pieces and in my book, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, your journal has revealed a very interesting story and inside of people's life and how dramatically it has changed over a rather short period of time. And I wonder whether this experience has informed you any hypothesis of how the society is likely to change in the coming years or even the next 20 years. And in that evolution, what might you be most excited about or worried about? Yeah, can we, we go to the next image actually? Or, oh, actually it's off. Um, I have some comparative pictures of the town, which is when we think about this 20 year gap, this is the 96 and that's 20 years later. Um, it is always really hard to predict, right? And I don't really get into predictions because that's not, um, you know, that's just not my thing basically. But you do notice that going, you know, looking at things over time, you observe different things. And, it's, and even your understanding of the past changes so dramatic. Like in this picture, you can see like in the left of this, lower image from the 90s, that was something I never noticed when I lived in Fuling. Um, then when you look in that, you can see a temple there. And then I look back at those old pictures, realize that must have been the ruins of a temple. And it turns out that was a Confucian temple. I went down and, and talked to people there. That was a Confucian temple that had been uh, taken down, actually during the Great Leap Forward, before the Cultural Revolution, um, when, basically because people were starving and they were trying to find any materials that they could sell. But so there's all these things that you notice, and so it's, you know, which I never it, didn't think about then. Go to the next one. Um, and this is a picture of the rivers, and um, you know, the city has grown up. The, the fields have also grown up. The farming is not as intense. The trees are higher. They're used, you know, because farmers wouldn't let trees grow in the old days because, they, because of the shade, but very few people are farming now. Um, so even the land has had this dramatic change. These were all things at the time that I, you know, I had a sense that the place was changing, but I never would have predicted a lot of the stuff that I've seen. Um, so I can't really predict in 20 years. I mean, I, and 20 years ago, if you'd asked me, I would have said the political system would be different by now. I never would have thought that, it, that the party would sort of be as strong as it's been. That wouldn't have been something that, that, that I predicted. Um, so yeah, I, you know, it's, it's uh, I think all, all I try to do is explain what I'm, what I'm observing now and give it some context from what I observed in the past. Thanks. Do we have any, any other questions or? Okay. 
Sorry, last question. Um, so after all these years of your observation in China and you saw a lot of changes, and from your perspective, what is your message to those people who still want to transfer China to a better place? To transfer China to a better, well, yeah, I mean, Especially I- Especially during this hard time. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm, and I hear from a lot of people, and of course I had this conversation with a lot of students all, all the time, you know, um, how do we move this in a better direction? Um, and I think it's, you know, I can understand that it's, it's, it's a demoralizing period for a lot of people, um, for a lot of young people. I mean, I, I, I'm glad, as I said, I'm, I'm glad to see that people are still going overseas. I think that's part of the process, that, that they're picking up as much information as they can. Um, but in terms of the next step, I mean, I, I just hope that there becomes a little more space for people. Um, it still is striking how many young Chinese go back. You know, 372 or so were going, 372,000 were leaving every year to study in the U.S. like in 2019 before the pandemic. Um, which is, again is something that's really unprecedented. We've never had a country where this many people would go. Um, and you always wonder, well, what's, eventually does that help create change? And sometimes I would ask these students because I was impressed at how well they understood the system. They did understand the weaknesses as well as the strengths. And, and I said, well, does this mean that when you're older, you'll find a way to change it? Or does it just mean that you'll be better at adapting? You know? And again, this is one of these things that it can go both ways. And when I asked my students this question, I would hear both responses. You know? um, but I think that's really the question I have. I do feel like there is a, a lot of young people who are much more aware they're, they're sort of, it's very different from generations in the past, but the question is, do they decide that this is, that it's best to adapt to the system, or do they decide that they want to make some, some changes um, and, 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 and try to open things up? So we'll see. Uh, you know, in the end, uh, that will be for, for them to decide. So. Okay. Well, let me, um, I'm Mark here, I'm the director here at the Institute. And, and Mark was the director of the Peace Corps when I was there, right? That's right. Yeah. So I have some personal privilege here to, uh, to, to thank you, and certainly it's special to have your beautiful introduction, but as the director of the Peace Corps, knowing the impact of what our volunteers have done, uh, to sit here and to hear your reflections after 20 years is, is really inspiring, and certainly to have it perhaps in a Kennedy School of all places is especially important. So thanks to our Thank you. 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 Thank you.